Germany. Now, joining me now are two members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery. Mia Rabson is a parliamentary reporter for the, the Canadian Press, and Ian Bailey is a national and parliamentary reporter with The Globe and Mail. Both of you, welcome. Thanks for having Hi, us. Hi, how are you guys doing? Yeah. Good, good. Now, listen, let's start. Uh, I have to say, earlier in the show, I spoke to two conservative observers, both of whom felt that watching last night's debate, uh, they don't feel that Pierre Poilievre, the uh, purported front runner, did himself any favors, that he was a bit too aggressive, not prime ministerial enough, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I want to get your reading on it. What stands out for you uh, in this first debate, Mia? I think what was amazing to me from the takeaway from this is nobody remembers the policies that they were talking about. All people are talking about is how much they were attacking each other, how aggressive Polyev was, the, the personal attacks. They even attacked Patrick Brown, who wasn't on the stage, and it, including the moderator. It was, it was a very interesting uh, dynamic. Uh, you definitely saw sort of the, the goals, who they each are trying to go after, who they think is their main competition. Um, but you also can sort of hear the other political parties just piling up the attack ads that they can use against whoever does end up winning this uh, this race. Uh, the conservative leadership candidates are doing the work of the opposition parties for them for the next election. If you look at what they were all saying about each other last night, it was really, really rough. Well, this is very interesting because, I mean, a lot of it's often been said that, uh, yeah, opposing political parties love to watch uh, leadership races. We, uh, we often had clips used by the conservatives against the liberals uh, when it was a question of uh, Stéphane Dion, etc. Uh, Ian, what do you make of it? What were your, what's your takeaway from this? Well, it shouldn't have been a surprise uh, because they have been uh, firing back and forth at each other by social media and in comments and such, but the hostility between Mr. Charest and Mr. Polyev was quite something to see, um, quite sustained and, and quite uh, quite tough. Um, also was surprised Leslie Lewis on um, taking on Mr. Polyev at another point uh, in the debate was kind of something that was a little bit of a surprise, um, sort of an out of the blue surprise um, as well. Um, yeah, I agree that uh, this material will perhaps provide fodder for um, the opposition parties and or the critics to the to the Conservative Party, the rivals of the Conservative Party in you know, time ahead. Although there are two party sanctioned events, uh, uh, debates coming up this month, and so we'll see if that changes or moderates or what material that provides, and also if the candidates um, change their approach in those uh, two debates. Okay, another question. What do you think of Patrick Brown's decision not to take part? Mia. Well, given what happened last night, maybe it was a good idea because, I mean, he got attacked anyway, but... Uh, I mean, someone, I think, so described it a little bit as if, you know, Twitter come to life, because as you mentioned, these are the attacks that have happened on Twitter, which can be quite nasty. Uh, maybe it was better for him to stay out of the fray. Uh, it's interesting that he also didn't think that he needed to be there, whether the audience for this particular debate isn't who he was going after. Um, you know, it's not unheard of for candidates not to be at debates. Uh, Justin Trudeau, of course, skipped a debate during the general election in 2019. Uh, it didn't seem to hurt him in that particular instance, but it's a little bit bold when you're trying to get people to know who you are and measure up against the other candidates to say, I don't think I need to be there. It's It sends a bit of a message, but uh, they obviously did that calculation. Okay, Ian, your thoughts on that? Because, I mean, it's, it's often been suggested that of the attacks, the most virulent ones have happened between Patrick Brown and, and Pierre Poilievre so far in the Twitterverse, as you say, and it was interesting that uh, Patrick Brown chose not to attend. It would have been an interesting debate to have Mr. Brown there. He's an experienced politician. And um, it would have been interesting to see how he would have uh, sort of um, how the, 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 the back and forth of attacks would have been affected by him being on the stage and, and getting into it. I also assume it would have given him a chance to sort of uh, find his way, find his place among these folks ahead of the uh, party sanctioned debates later this month. Um, President Manning was talking earlier today at the... Uh, at uh, this conference that hosted this debate and sort of talked about how the candidates, you know, were feeling their way in this uh, this debate um, in a way that will be helpful to them in the future. That kind of experience might have been helpful for Mr. Brown, but but it, it does seem a bit odd that he chose not to attend, although, as Mia said, that's not unprecedented mm -hmm. in these kinds of uh, matters. And, and, and as you mentioned, there are debates to come, in, in fact, starting with the official, first official debate uh, next Wednesday. Look, I want to change subjects to the other big subject that came into Canadian politics. It was propelled into Canadian politics because of what's happening in the United States, and that is this leaked draft from the U.S. Supreme Court suggesting that that court may be ready to strike down abortion rights in the U.S. First question, our systems are very different. Our situations are different. 
how concerned should Canadians who are in favor of free reproductive choice for women, how concerned should Canadians be? Mia. If you listen to the Liberals, they should be very concerned. If you listen to the Conservatives, generally they shouldn't be concerned at all. The Conservatives in general are saying that they have no intention of reopening this debate. Not all of them, of course, but many of them. Um, the Liberals are trying to use this to the same political advantage that they've been able to do for years. Um, it's it's certainly, with not, uh, certainly worth mentioning, of course, that there was a private member's bill to uh, restrict some abortions, sex-selective abortions, just last summer that was voted on in Canada, brought up by a backbench uh, or a conservative MP, sorry, uh, and it was voted down. The Liberals will tell you 79 conservatives voted in favor of that. So there is a door open, I suppose, to some changes to what kinds of abortion and uh, are allowed or what uh, sort of the rules are. Uh, the Liberals talking about trying to do use legislation uh, to to codify the right to access an abortion in Canada. Uh, so we'll see where they go with that. But the Liberals see this as a win. They've used it successfully in multiple campaigns against the Conservatives. So for them, this uh, this was sort of, the, they sort of have been training for this their entire political lives. Mm -hmm. Ian, what do you make of it? Because I mean, there is still a debate about how much Canadians should really be concerned. It's no surprise that the American Supreme Court is now profoundly conservative. Uh, and a lot of people are saying this is not necessarily something we should be losing a lot of sleep of in Canada. What do you make of it all? Well, well two different countries in, in terms of aspects of the way that this, uh, this issue has been managed and in sort of the organized opposition to uh, abortion in the United States. Um, it seems that uh, a lot of the spotlight um, in Canada has been shone on shortcomings um, in liberal promises and the liberal approach to providing access to abortion, access to abortion services. So th that seems to be where a lot of the spotlight is being shown here, although as Mia said, you know, questions have been raised about the conservatives, you know, the leadership candidates. Um, you seem united in not getting into mm -hmm. this issue, of course. Leslie Lewis takes a different position as a social conservative running in the race. Well, I was going to ask you, though, I mean, Mia alluded to what the uh, Liberal government may be doing, and that is considering some sort of legislation to enshrine access. But what do you make of how the Conservatives dealt with it? And mid midway through the week, we saw Candace Bergen, the uh, interim leader, basically order Tory MPs to shut up and not comment on it. Ian, what do you make of that, uh, how that played out? Well, you know, she, she, she brought in that order that I know that the... Um the leadership candidates uh, did talk about it, I guess, because they, um, you know, they're they're vying for party support, and they, they need their positions to be clear. So, it, and I know that some MPs uh, did also did talk about it. So, sort of asking them not to talk about it didn't entirely work. I mean, inevitably, people will talk about it. And, and look at what's going on in the United States um, with Will versus Wade is is um, is still going on, and it's going to develop over quite some time, coming weeks and such. And um, so there may be further pressures to, to for, talk more about this mm -hmm. issue uh, on conservatives, on liberals and others in the uh, Canadian political scene. Okay, on that note, I, we can just promise people that we may be revisiting the issue as we wait for the uh, US Supreme Court to uh, release its ruling, I think only in June. But uh, listen, both of you have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Thank you, thank, thank you very you. much.